Good morning. Greetings to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. My name is David Solomon. My family and I have been part of Faith Church since 2011. I thank Pastor Joe and Pastor Brad for giving me this opportunity to share the Word of God with you today. Let's turn your Bibles or open your electronic devices to Exodus chapter 20. We are in the series, Life is a Highway, and we are going through the Ten Commandments that the Lord gave to the Israelites after he led them out of Egypt. Today, we are going to look into the last commandment. So let us remember that these commandments are the guardrails given by our Lord to protect us from our journey in this world, but not to condemn us. Let us read Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Initially, when I read this verse, I thought, I'm not interested in my neighbor's property or his wife, or the servants, and by the way, they don't have any donkeys, so I'm good. So I checked all the boxes, and I told myself that I did not break this commandment. But when I started meditating more on the word covet, I realized that it has a very deeper meaning. Covet or covetousness are words we don't use often in our regular vocabulary. In Greek, it means desire or desire for more. We hear this often. If only I had that, then I would be happy. Or I want that so bad. Rockefeller, the millionaire, was once asked, how much money does it make you to be happy? He replied, just a little bit more. Desire in itself, it's not a bad thing. In fact, it is good to desire for a good job, good health, good clothing, and good food. The world is filled with the things that are meant to be desired. The problem isn't in our desire, but our desire for more that makes us to covet. Why? It's because we want something so bad that we are willing to hurt someone or disobey God. It's like we are telling God, whatever you are given to me is not enough. So this commandment doesn't deal with outside condition, but mostly deals with the condition of our heart. First our eye sees it, then our emotions takes control over us and allows us to desire and go after the things we see. We often find ourselves driving around neighborhoods, wishing we could have a house like that, or we compare ourselves to the people in the TV shows or magazines, wishing we could have a body like him or her. Or maybe we wish we could have a perfect family that a coworker seems to have. This list goes on. I always had a fascination for cars. When we started our family, we traded our car and got a minivan within our budget. In a couple of years, I saw a newer model and I wanted them so badly. I convinced my wife that this new van had more space and more safety features. It was so hot in the market that we had to wait for a month to get it. The smell of the new car and the smooth ride quickly faded away when a high month, monthly payment kicked in slowly. I soon I realized I made a mistake and we ended up selling the car within a year. It is a human tendency that we always want something better or something more. 
God's word talks about this condition to desire for more in many places throughout the Bible. For example, we can see it from the beginning with Adam and Eve. When Eve was tempted by Satan, she sees the forbidden apple, and in her heart, she desires to acquire the knowledge and to be like God. Like it wasn't enough for her to be known and loved, but she wanted more. We can see another story in Joshua chapter 7. God tells the Israelites, when you win the battle over Babylon, don't take anything from them. But this guy named Achan, when he saw the shiny and beautiful things, he wanted them so badly and coveted them. Bible also warns how a strong believer in Christ can easily fall into temptation. For example, we can look into the life of King David. This was a man who truly loved the Lord and wrote the Psalms. God says he is the man after my own heart. God's anointing was on him and he gave victory over all his enemies. One day, he was supposed to be leading the army in the battle. We can see in 2 Samuel chapter 10, he stays in the palace. He lusts after Bathsheba, commits adultery, and to cover his tracks, he plots to murder her husband and gets him killed. By this act, he not only broke of quite a few commandments, but it also grieved God's heart. Like he said, God, what you were given to me is not enough. I want more. Even though King David had everything the world could offer, he had fame, wealth, power, authority. He had more than one wife and more concubines, but it wasn't enough. So what about us? What satisfies you? Or let me ask a different question. What are you going after that you think, when I get this thing, I will be satisfied? We think, when I get a bigger house, or a new job, or more children, or a new relationship, I will be satisfied. Will you? Do you know someone that who seems like they are always dissatisfied? You could give them an all-expense-paid trip to the Caribbean, and they could still complain about the heat. So we can see, when we are not satisfied with what God has given to us, we can easily fall into the sin like King David did, or even get addicted to drugs, gambling, or drinking. Do we not see these kind of conditions today in our society? These conditions not only affect the individuals, but it also affects the families as well. So, what is the source of our satisfaction? I noticed something. Often when we start to follow Jesus, we really get excited about it. We think, he is everything I'll ever need. We have the fire and zeal to live for Christ. But I've seen in my own personal life that over time that fire slowly dies and I start looking around for the things that could satisfy me. Christ follower, is Jesus still enough or do you need more? I think Jesus has this beautiful way of explaining why we start to look for satisfaction everywhere else. He says from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9 and verse 23, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Jesus says to deny ourselves. But the reality is that we are very consumed with ourselves, aren't we? We once thought Jesus has everything we need. Then we start to desire for security, health, uh, or wealth, or comfort. When we get it, we still, we still left with wanting something more. 
Deny myself doesn't mean that I need to isolate from the world and forsake all human relationships. It's something very different. Apostle Paul has a great way of explaining what it means to have everything we ever wanted in Jesus Christ. Let's look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself to me. Apostle Paul is not saying that we need to go and crucify ourselves. He's talking about the inner person, I. It is my self-righteousness, my self-trust, my self-pity, my self-will, my pride, my greed, my arrogance, my short temper needs to be crucified on the cross. The, all the selfish desires of more needs to be crucified. The I of myself must be crucified. The next part of the verse says, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Is Jesus Christ enough for me? The life that he has given to me is enough? Or do I need more? Or am I trying to hold on to the old I, the desires that I had for so many other things? The next part of the verse says, I live by faith. It is very hard to live by faith. It is by faith I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. It is by faith I, my old person, is crucified with Christ. It is by faith that I died to sin with Christ. And it is by faith I am a new creation, raised with Christ. Our source of satisfaction is Jesus Christ. So Jesus offers a way out to overcome the desire for more of this world. Listen to what he says in the Gospel of John, chapter 7, verse 37 to 38. That anyone who is thirsty, come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. When our desire for more starts to rise up, when we feel the spirit of coveting or envy or greed starts to overpower us, Jesus says, come to me. I will give you everything you need. Underline the word, come to me. It is an invitation from Jesus. My desire of more of this world needs to be changed to the desire of more of Jesus. So the truth is, the world has too, too much good stuff to offer. Some good, some not good. So how do we beat the trap of having this attitude, God, what you have given to me is not enough? Bible tells us or uses this phrase by renewing of our mind. In Romans chapter 12, Verse 2, Paul says this, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by renewing of your mind. We need to reset our hearts and minds, and we need a renewal. Let's look at a couple of practical ways to renew our minds. First, renewing of our mind by the Word of God. We renew our mind when we dwell in the Word of God. Psalm 119, 10, 11 says, I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Let's not just read the Bible. Let it soak into our hearts, into our minds, into our bones. Also, we can see in Ephesians chapter 5, as a fresh water cleanses our bodies, God's written word washes us clean deep down inside our souls. It, it purifies our thoughts. 
scrubs our motives and our minds as we observe it and obey its truth. Secondly, we renew our mind by seeking God every day through prayer. This is one of the important things that most of the believers fail to do in our walk with God. We pray to him occasionally or when we are in need, but not every day. Ravi Zacharias, one of the greatest thinkers, says this regarding prayer. If you are a praying Christian, your faith in God will carry you. If you are not a praying Christian, you have to carry your faith and you will get exhausted trying to carry it. We need to discipline ourselves to be alone with God in His presence. Go to a closet or find a quiet place and seek Him every day. Dear brothers and sisters, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence, with thanksgiving and praise and worship. Let us confess our sins and repent from our sins. We must ask the Holy Spirit to search us deeper and reveal any hidden rebellion that we may have or any sin that we may have. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to sanctify us every day with his word and with his truth. Jesus says that your Father in heaven knows what you need even before you ask him. As we seek him every day, let us not stop our prayers with our needs. Let us move forward asking the Holy Spirit to know more of Jesus. Let us ask the Holy Spirit to give us the spirit of wisdom and spirit of revelation that, so that we can know more of Jesus. When Moses led the people of Israel out of Egypt, when they are in wilderness, these people start complaining, making idols and fighting each other. They look for satisfaction in material things. Instead of joining and reasoning with the people, Moses pitches a tent outside of the camp and sought God and spent time in his presence. He is crying out to God for his people and asking him, Lord, teach me your ways that I may know you more. Let these people know who you are. As he spent time in his presence, our heavenly father reveals to Moses, I am the Lord who is so compassionate and gracious God. I am the Lord who is slow to anger. I am the Lord, your God, who is abounding in love and faithfulness. Dear brothers and sisters, let us desire for more of Jesus. As Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, in order to gain the knowledge of Christ, he considers the knowledge he acquired to be a great scholar as dust and nothing. He doesn't want the book knowledge. He wants to gain Christ. He wants to know him more. And he wants to know the power that resurrected Christ. I encourage you, my dear brothers and sisters, let us grow in his grace. Let us grow in the knowledge of our loving Savior, Jesus Christ. As we long for Jesus and seek him every day, we will become like him and able to bear fruit. The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. As we bear fruit, we will experience the fullness of joy and the everlasting peace in our hearts. Our innermost soul will be satisfied. Our outward craving will be quenched by our inner satisfaction. I close with this thought. In John chapter 7, verse 38, we see Jesus invites us to come to him. As we seek, as we seek him, as we drink from him, he promised the spring of living water flows within us. 
Christ blesses with abundant river of living water so that we will be source of blessing to others. What a promise and what a blessing. As we desire for more of Jesus, we will not only be satisfied, but we will be a blessing to our families, to our neighbors, to our community, and to our church. So again, let me ask you, what satisfies you? If you had everything you wanted, would you be happy? Jesus only can fully satisfy you. As we end this series on the Ten Commandments, the first four commandments are about the vertical relationship between us and God. The next six commandments are about our relationship with each other. These two relationships, the vertical and the horizontal relationships, meet at the cross of the Calvary of Jesus Christ. Jesus sums all these commands into love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus invites you to come to him today. He says, I am the living bread. Do you trust him that he will provide your needs? Jesus says, I am a good shepherd. Do you trust him with all your life solely dependent on him? Do you trust the Lord who says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the Egypt of the land of slavery. I gave my son Jesus to die for you, for your sins, to redeem you and give you everlasting life. Do you desire for more of Jesus? We come to the cross today and surrender to him and be satisfied only in him. Can you close your eyes and examine your hearts? The Holy Spirit is talking to you today. Are you far away from him? Are you drifted away during this season? Jesus says, come to me. Is the fear gripping you? Are you going through a lot of pain? Are you wondering how I'm going to navigate this season of pandemic that we are in? Jesus says, come to me. Are you angry or tired with what's going on in our country? With so much of hatred and racial injustice and political divisions. Jesus says, come to me. Instead of looking things from outside, can you look up towards him? Like what Moses did. Let's pray and ask the Lord, Lord, teach me your way that I may know him more. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this time, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us today very clearly. Instead of seeking this world and desiring for this more of this world, Lord, you're asking us to seek you more of you during this time. During the time of the trouble and calamity, Lord, you are our refuge, you are our strength, you are our fortress, and you are our salvation. And you are our present help in our needs. Lord, I pray for my dear brothers and sisters. Lord, I pray blessings on them, Lord Jesus. Lord, bless their families and children and elders. Lord, with your joy and peace and your strength, Lord. Let your face shine upon each and every one of the families, Lord. Help us, Lord, to desire for more of you. Help us to, to be thirst for more of you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for everything. Thank you for your son, of, son Jesus, who died on the cross for us. Thank you, Jesus. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen.